What does Bitcoin have in common with companies that rode the technological wave of the internet, like Amazon, Microsoft, or Netflix? Why is it that game-changing technological innovations can stare us right in the face and we still miss them? Today, we're going deep on the adoption of Bitcoin, how it compares to other innovations like the internet, and why it is the best asymmetric bet on the planet right now, and the one asset you should be holding in your portfolio. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bitcoin Daily Show. I'm Dante Cook, head of Swan Business. Why are game-changing innovations and investments that are staring us right in our face so easy to ignore? Let's go all the way back to 2000. There was a small startup called Netflix that was on track to do $5 million in revenue that year. The Goliath in its industry, Blockbuster, was on track to do $6 billion that year. Netflix had 350 employees. Blockbuster had 9,000 stores. The three-year-old startup had some success, but was desperate for cash in order to shore up its inventory and also expand its business model. So they had a big idea that they thought would be able to save their company or take them to the next level. How about we get an investment from Blockbuster? So Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings went to Blockbuster's office to pitch this idea to John Antioco, Blockbuster CEO at the time. The pitch was pretty simple. Blockbuster will be able to take advantage of Netflix's distribution, its technology, in order to help it accelerate into the DVD market, and also increase their inventory, reduce the late fees that their customers hated, and in turn, improve customer satisfaction. Blockbuster's executive team sat back and they said, yeah, you guys have had a little bit of success, but this whole internet thing is just a fad. It's not going to catch on and it's overblown. Towards the end of the meeting, after Reed Hastings had pitched so much about the company and where they were going with the internet and digital and streaming, Blockbuster CEO leaned in and he asked, so how much is it going to take for us to buy you guys? Reed Hastings confidently replied, $50 million. Their executives did everything that they could to not laugh them out of the room. Ultimately, $50 million was way too much because dot-com companies just weren't going to last. Fast forward to today. Netflix is now worth $265 billion. And Blockbuster, well, you know how that ended. The idea of a mail order DVD rental service or a content streaming platform seems like it's pretty commonplace and common sense right now. But back then, it wasn't. Netflix was a new and novel idea and technology that was built on the back of another technology, the internet. The revolution wasn't just what they were building. The revolution was that they removed the middleman from the process. Since 2002, when the company went public, it's returned over 50,000% to its investors. The network effects and adoptions at the time were definitely hard to see. But in hindsight, when you look at their growth and their numbers, you could see it clearly wasn't a fad. The thing that Blockbuster's executives needed, just like other people who dismissed Amazon.com as just a bookstore that will be nothing more and not a real company, or IBM who dismissed Microsoft as some smart whiz kids from Redland Shores, or Apple with the Apple II and the Mac as simply toys that would never be able to compete with IBM's PCs or mainframe. They all needed a dose of humble pie to just humble themselves and remove their ego to see what was actually happening. Similar to IBM, to John Antioco from Blockbuster, to Barnes & Noble, Larry Lepard did not see that Microsoft was going to be the company that it was. He admits that he sold out way too early on Microsoft and sold its position for a condo. Microsoft is now worth $3.12 trillion. It's a mistake that a lot of investors make, I think, and that is to say you've got a gain and you're feeling good about it and you think, oh, this can't last and maybe it's overpriced now and therefore I'll sell it. Um, I bought Microsoft in 86 when it went public, 14 times trailing, growing 40% a year. And I made, I don't know, three times my money on it. And I sold it for a, a logical reason, actually, because it was the only money I had to make a down payment on a condominium and I wanted to own a condominium. So, um, but had I held on to it, it, you know, it, it turned out it went up another 4,000 X and I, and I missed all of that. The, the killer stocks, if you really look at some of the greatest stock returns that have been made in the last 30 years of investing, They've generally been in the base layer of something that grows and spreads to become ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And they've got kind of a monopoly position and a network effect. And, and I, so I put in that bucket, you know, Microsoft was probably the first one. Google is another one. Facebook is another one. 
you know, this is buying, buying, you know, Bitcoin right here is buying Microsoft in its first five or 10 years of existence, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the base layer of the new form of money and ultimately everything will be denominated in SATs. So there are a lot of people who don't understand this asset. They're going to buy it and it's going to work and they're going to feel great. And they're going to think, hey, I made three or four times my money and they're going to sell it, yeah. not realizing that it's going to just keep, you know, as he says, it's going up forever, Laura. I mean, this thing, you know, in, unless we're wrong about this being adopted as the base layer of money, and I see no evidence to suggest that's the case, this these coins will be, you know, 100,000, then they'll be 400, then they'll be a million, then they'll be 4 million, then they'll be 10 million, you know, and, and, and the time frame on all of that is probably 20 years because, you know, Microsoft started in, in the early 80s, and here we are 40 years later, you know, that it's the multi-billion dollar company that it is. So this this doesn't happen overnight, but the point, you know, as you raise is you don't want to sell a cornerstone asset that can't be replicated um, and, and can't be debased just because you have a profit in it. Bitcoin is being adopted and growing faster than any technology we've ever seen. Right now, you may be dismissing it and calling it a fad, but I think in the future, we'll all agree that it's something that you shouldn't have ignored. The asymmetry on this asset is unlike anything that we've ever seen. That's why just having a small percentage of it in your portfolio can have outsized returns. In the same way that Netflix captured the value of physical stores, DVDs, movie theaters, Bitcoin is demonetizing the physical stores of value in form of perfect digital property. I ran a quick simulation for us. I created a portfolio that was equally weighted with Amazon, Microsoft, Netflix, and Apple. Over the past nine years and six months, that's the amount of data that I was able to collect on Bitcoin or what we have at NakamotoPortfolio.com. This portfolio underperformed Bitcoin by itself by 43% a year. But I can understand holding 100% of Bitcoin might be too risky for you. And if you're older or near retirement age, it might not be the best investment advice. So I decided to look at some other allocations. A 1% allocation would have improved your returns by 2% a year. A 5% allocation would have improved your returns by almost 8% a year. A 10% allocation would have improved your returns by 14% a year. In this portfolio, Bitcoin would have been the best performing asset six out of the last 10 years. The optimal risk return profile over the last nine years would have been this. You would have had a weighting of Netflix at 9.3%, Apple at 10.5%, Amazon at 18%, Microsoft at 35.7%, and Bitcoin at 26.6%. Join our webinar later today with Larry Lepard, CEO of Equity Management Associates, who's been helping clients and managing money for over 40 years. Larry, as we said earlier, admitted to selling out of Microsoft too early and has been a historical gold bug. And as a boomer, he's come to recognize the value of Bitcoin, why it should be in his portfolios and the value that it has for the future of our society. I admire Larry's humbleness and his ability to say, hey, maybe I've got some things wrong in the past. You'll definitely want to hear what he says because he has a lot of wisdom of how this will be valuable in your portfolio moving forward. The link is in the show notes. You won't want to miss it. It will be on live at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Or if you can't catch the show live, you'll be able to go back and catch the recording at a later time. And with that, we're signing off for today. We won't be recording an episode on Friday because I'll be driving to Philadelphia to celebrate my grandmother's birthday with my four kids and my wife and celebrating Easter weekend. I pray that you're able to do the same. I hope that you're able to find some hope and some light in the midst of all this darkness and talk of darkness around us. This is Dante Cook with Swan.com. Happy stacking.